I love Fridays because, because they come packed with information, entertainment, and a little bit of both all at the same time. It is Friday, and that means Ryan Snyder, our recruiting insider, and our handicapper is joining us today to do <laughs> Snyder's Best Bets. And today we're going to be doing a mailbag for Penn State recruiting questions. Now, Ryan's full mailbag is over at bwi.rivals.com, Blue White Illustrated, every Friday. But we're going to answer a couple questions here, and if you want to check out the rest to get the full insight from Ryan, go to Blue White Illustrated. So, uh, Ryan, happy Friday. Game week, first game home at Beaver Stadium since 2019. How you feeling heading into the weekend? Should be good. Uh, you know, we, we have a pretty uh, solid group of prospects. We'll talk about that a little bit. I mean, it's it's Ball State and, and Auburn's next week, so it's not the 130 plus kids and uh, all their family and everything that that you'll see next week. But there, you know, there's a handful of of pretty good players coming up. A, a handful of committed players too, which is good. You know, the the committed guys haven't been able to get up and see too many games. A couple of them came when they were young, but uh, you know, just just getting getting back in the groove of things, man. Hosting recruits and um, you know, getting get the show, not just that Beaver Stadium atmosphere, but everything else. That's that's kind of what it's all about. And, uh, you know, I know everybody up in Lash is really excited about that. We'll be getting to that. Um, actually, might as well get started with that right now in the recruiting mailbag on the <laughs> BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, answering some questions that you submitted to Ryan Snyder on Twitter. And if you want to submit a question at Rival Snyder, you see that under his Lovely picture there. So if you want to make sure you get your questions answered on the recruiting mailbag, follow him on Twitter and then submit your question. He takes them starting what Thursday? You start on Thursdays and then yeah. it up Friday? Yeah, usually. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the most so part. So our, our first question, let me pull it up here. Our first question comes from Houseman33. Any big recruits coming up for the first game? Yeah, so as I mentioned, there's a, there's a handful of committed guys coming up. Uh, Caden Saunders and, and Drew Saunders, or Drew, Drew Shelton, excuse me, uh, both put it out there that they'll be here. And uh, when you when we looked over this list this weekend, it, the biggest uh, you know, scholarship prospects, uh, I guess you would say, are are for the most part the committed guys. You know, I expect Nick Singleton to be there. Uh, the the Lackawanna game was actually canceled uh, tomorrow. That was where I was planning to go originally. Uh, so, but that allows JB Nelson, Tyrese Mills to come up here. Uh, Ken Talley should be making the trip as well. So, having a handful of the committed guys coming up, uh, you know, as I mentioned, just the, a lot of them haven't really been able to to see what it's like in Beaver Stadium yet, and, and this will be a good opportunity for them to do that. When when we look at 2022, 2023, uh, there, there's two players I think for 2023 and even 2024 uh, that I think fans will be interested in to keep an eye on uh, tight end Joey Schlafler uh, is, is Michael Menett's half brother he doesn't hold an offer yet but uh, you know, he's, he's definitely someone that a lot of schools are very interested in he has over a dozen offers already and and Penn State's keeping a, a close eye on him I expect them to actually go see him play here in, in uh, well tonight actually we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute uh, but but you know I, I think Joey Brings a lot to the table. A uh, lot love his size. Pretty pretty athletic. He plays wide receiver uh, yeah. a good bit for extra township. Uh, so I just just curious to see what Penn State decides to do there. Uh, I, I've always kind of thought that I do think he will get an offer at some point. I think Penn State's kind of being being careful with him because of the family ties because they know that if they offer him, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know that. There's there's a real chance he would consider committing. Uh, he's, he's like I mentioned. I think he's at 17 offers now. Six six two ten. There's there's a lot to work with there, uh, and he's putting up some good film to start the year. So someone to definitely keep an eye on. And then one other one other notable is 2024 athlete Quentin Martin at Bell Vernon. He's another player who oh, I, I think I think Quentin's going to maybe be the best player for 2024 in Pennsylvania. We'll, there's there's others yeah. that will emerge, but right now yeah. uh, he's he's looking like an excellent player. Maryland, Pitt, Rutgers, Virginia Tech, I believe West Virginia is his other offer, and Penn State, excuse me. And he's just man, he can do so much. He, he he's a running back primarily for them, but he can play wide receiver. Uh, he's a pretty good safety, a good cornerback. He's played good linebacker. Too. You just go, yeah, go watch his film. He is. He does a little bit of everything. Six three, one eighty. Curious to see how schools um, recruit him or where they recruit him at because of his size. Like as I mentioned, he's predominantly a running back for for Bell Vernon, but 
Uh, I, I know a couple schools think he could be a good linebacker, 6'3", 180. Yeah. You know, put, yeah. but he has he has a lot of room to grow still. So that he could be a defensive that end. Fits the looking mold. at his looking at his size, he could be a defensive end too. Like he's that big and that sort of frame that early. The the potential mm-hmm. feels pretty limitless. I think you're you're spot on with that. Yeah, he runs like a four four, I believe too. He hasn't been to too many camps, but just from talking to you know people close to Belle Vernon, that's that's kind of the number I get. Which um, you know, when you look at his film, it everything backs that up. So those are two guys that I, I think right now this week uh, are you know the ones that Penn State fans should be keep a close eye on. I would I would argue that uh, aside from the committed players, Martin's probably the top overall prospect visiting as far as um, long term potential. So it's a solid group. It'll be like forty or so players. Um, coming up, there's there's a, a good group of potential walk on guys. Uh, Gabe, Gabe, just a couple others I'll run through real quick. Gabe Arena, uh, Bishop McDevitt's game was canceled canceled this weekend. Arena has a, an offer from Virginia Tech. He camps with the staff. Uh, he'll be up. And also Cooper Young is a is solid offensive lineman, uh, Downingtown West. He has a handful of offers. I believe Pitt is one of them. Uh, so we'll see. I, you know, Penn State wants to just kind of watch their film and, and go from there. But I would expect 45 or so, 40, 45 prospects to be on campus and um you know next weekend's the big one so this is something you and i were talking a little bit about before and i find this to be a really interesting unique situation where normally you're right with the with the whiteout game coming up next weekend and the recruiting list supposed to be you know gigantic as as it is every year but this is a really unique situation first time fans are in the stadium since 2019 and I, I just think that people are underselling the environment of what's going to happen on uh, tomorrow based on what we're what what we have been through over the last year. I think fans are going to treat this like it's a big primetime game. It's a near sellout already. Um, you know, is, is that something to factor into all of this stuff when it comes to you know impressing these recruits? Because you might say Quentin Martin, if he's that important, why is he not here for the whiteout game? Is, is that fair? Like, is that fair to? add that into the equation for this game? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not even just about the in-stadium atmosphere. You know, like obviously uh, bring them to the whiteout and that's you know, the loudest you'll get, the the most intense moments. But it's about, it's about downtown State College. You know, it's about the tailgating scene. It's about everything that goes along with game day. And, and that's what sells State College. That's that's kind of the charm of State College. So whether you're here for Ball State or Villanova or, or Auburn or Michigan, it's all outside the stadium. It's all the same. It's it's pretty similar inside the stadium, too, man. As long as it's a competitive game, uh, we all know Penn State fans will, <laughs> will make it a, a great home field advantage. So I, I just with players not being able to come up here for so long, you know, get them up here, show them that environment. Um, and, and I think that it kind of just takes care of itself. Yeah, and I, I haven't I haven't looked at the forecast for tomorrow, but it's supposed to be perfect today. I imagine it'll be something like that tomorrow, and that's always a selling point too, is when you get on campus, especially during the fall, and it's you, you have one of those 72-degree days, it does feel a little like paradise. Like, it is a beautiful campus. So that's that's always a part of the, the equation too. Uh, I want to go to on to our next question, and I imagine you get a lot of questions from people uh, at PSU recruit talk. I imagine he's a regular. He or she is a regular. <laughs> Besides trip and battle, are there any 2023s that we should keep an eye on for a potential commitment during the season? Yeah, so I've got a hit on Antonio Tripp and Sean Battle a lot in the summertime. Sean Battle kind of, I don't want to say he hinted he was close to committing, but he made it very clear that he was really feeling Penn State after a few visits. And uh, Antonio Tripp, of course, McDonough prospect. He's been up here a lot. Penn State's his top offer. I think both of those guys uh, would love to be part of this, and I think there's a s- still a very good chance they will. I also will just stress, though, that Penn State really wants to see film from those guys still, too. You know, Tri- Tripp just didn't play at all uh, last season. McDonough didn't play at all. So I-, I think Penn State really wants to see how they develop, and, and-, and battle kind of could – potentially play a couple positions depending on how he grows. So I, I don't want to give the impression that Penn State's, you know, cooled on them or not pushing hard for them. They, they like them a lot, but um, just from what, what we saw in June and July and, and then what I see now as far as how hard they're pushing for a commitment, I, I think they just want to gather more information first. Uh, but but both of those guys, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up here. So I'll stress that on those two. As far as someone, a 2023, who could commit in sometime during the season, I've been pushing Lamont Payne for a long time now. I put a future cast in for him this week. 
and we know he's coming back for the Auburn game. He's just one of those players who every time he's here, I'm going to probably have a story pre-written, you know, to, to you know, be careful for, for a commitment. I, I think he's yeah. heavily leaning towards Penn State. Now, whether it would be for the Auburn game or, or you know, another visit down the road or even after the season, it, it's tough to say. You know, he hasn't really opened up and, and said he's, you know, truly thinking about committing now or then or, or whenever it may be. But again, I mean, I just – the visits kind of speak um, speak loudly here, I guess. He's been up three times. This will be his fourth visit now since June. I think he has an awesome relationship with Terry Smith. And and this is also a player I know who the staff would, would take his commitment today if, if he called them up. So Lamont would be my pick as far as someone to watch this month, next month, whenever it may be. You know, the, the question was during the season, I'll go with Lamont Payne from Chartes Valley. And that's one that uh, you're reporting after the Lash Bash kind of put that on the radar of how well that seemed to go with the staff and with Lamont Payne. So keeping an eye on him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the month and then heading into the season, probably a pretty good idea. One thing that I think kind of folds into not just Lamont Payne, but Antonio Tripp and everything we've talked about so far is wanting to see more film, especially about those first two guys. We're, we're getting the coaches out on the road for the first time this year. Um, how important is that? And does it set a tone for what schools they're going to and what they're prioritizing to start the in-person scouting and evaluation again? Mm -hmm. Well, throughout the course of the year, they'll, they'll get out to pretty much all of these top schools in the area. Where they're going now compared to later. I don't, I think it's more so just scheduling based, you know, whether Penn State's home or away, you know, what kind of a top matchup can they find? I, I spoke earlier this week publicly that we know James Franklin and Terry Smith are heading down to Philadelphia tonight. Uh, Northeast, which is where Ken Talley, uh, Rennell Nuka, and Keon Wright, um, Nuka and Wright are two solid 2023 prospects. Uh, they're playing St. Peter's Prep, which is a, a really good uh, school from New Jersey. And I expect Terry and, and James to be at that game. Uh, they'll also hit up a few other schools uh, in Philadelphia throughout today. Uh, I know like Northeast, obviously, they'll, they'll stop by that school before the game. Uh, and Archbishop Woods, another one. There's a couple others then in, in South Jersey. We'll, we'll keep, the, keep that for the message board. But <clears throat> I know Ty Howe is also going to go out and see Joey Schlaf uh, Schlafler. I, I mentioned that earlier when I was discussing him. He's actually going to see uh, Exeter Township play Wilson tonight. And that's why I kind of really think Penn State fans should keep an eye on him. You know, they're going out to watch them. They've seen enough film already that they, they clearly like something. And then when you add in those family ties, you know, he could be somebody to maybe watch for an offer here in the in the days and weeks ahead. So uh, J1 Slider then is going to Virginia. We'll, we'll keep the, uh, the the schools to the message board. But uh, all three of those guys are, are – or four of those coaches are, are hitting the road. And, you know, just, just to get out and, and, and meet with people again, that's, that's – that's just as big as the in-person evaluation part of this. Franklin, yeah. <laughs> Franklin talks all the time about, you know, he wants to meet the guidance counselor. He wants to meet the janitor, uh, the principals, the teachers, whomever it is. And, and that they'll take as much information away from that as far as the character, uh, you know, grades and whatnot, uh, as far as just actually watching the player play. They, they've seen enough film on these guys. They've had them up for camps now. Uh, they, they know what kind of athletes they are. You know, they want to they want to I don't want to call it a background check, but, you know, they want to learn more about the, the player, the person's family. Yeah. And that's really kind of what you get out of these visits uh, as much as anything else. So and that kind of leads me to kind of a question a little off topic, a little out of left field. But something I've been thinking about is um, what you just said there. They've had these guys up to camp. They've seen some film. Are we going to see a couple of guys maybe that came out of nowhere because of last year, kind of going back to what we talked about with needing to see more from certain guys? There's a lot of the upcoming classes we probably haven't seen anything of. Would you would you think that there's a couple guys they're going to go out and find? Or has the finding process been done through camps and through early evaluation, things like that, before we even get to the fall? Oh, well, they still played last year. So there is still, um, you know, limited high school film from last season. Okay. When when you're a school like Penn State, <laughs> you have the resources to find everybody. So I, yeah. I think for the most part, I mean, Penn State's extended 13. So we'll just take Pennsylvania, for example. Penn State's extended 13 scholarship offers uh, to 2023 prospects in Pennsylvania. That, that'll probably end up being 80% 
of the the offers they extend in, in PA between now and uh, December 2023. So a couple other guys will emerge. You know, there's definitely players that they're watching, but for the most part, they know who they're going after uh, by this by this stage in the process. Um, I think we have one more question to get to here. Uh, this one's from CMCG926. Who are the big 23 names that are confirmed for next weekend for the whiteout? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, man, this is uh, this will be the big one. I, I would expect probably about 120 or so prospects for this game. And, uh, of course, like all the committed guys will be there. Um, but with 2022 being just about done, the, it'll be a very heavy 2023 list. So Sean Battle and Antonio Tripp, we talked about them already. I expect both of them to to be up next weekend. Well, one one guy I think fans should keep an eye on is Kobe Keenum from from Alabama. Actually, he came up mm-hmm. uh, for for an unofficial visit in the summer, and he's built a very good relationship uh, with with really everybody on the South Trout Wine, especially of course. Uh, he's planning to come up. He actually grew up an Auburn fan, so that that's a little interesting dynamic there. Uh, I believe I believe Auburn's offered him. Uh, but, but either way, I mean, he's he's going to be a guy who uh, a lot of schools are keeping an eye on down south. So we'll we'll see how that develops. Right now, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Penn State's a favorite though with Keenum. So keep an eye on him in the months ahead. There's actually a, a couple pretty good O linemen. Luke Montgomery's coming back from Ohio. He's been on campus a bunch of times already. I, I believe this will be his third visit, and one of those visits actually was during the dead period. So he came up. Uh, just to just to see the town himself, and Penn State was his first big offer there, so that mm-hmm. that'll hold some weight. But he he also has you know Ohio State and a lot of other top schools, so um, you know it, he won't be an easy get. But just getting him back, yeah. obviously for the whiteout, good. Josh Miller too, uh, uh, another offensive lineman from uh, Life Christian Academy in Virginia is planning to come up. Uh, Tamir Robinson's a linebacker. Uh, Penn State fans should know all about him. He's the top top prospect in Pennsylvania this year from Brashear. He's expected to come back. So it, it'll be a pretty, it'll be a pretty good crowd. Uh, I'm trying to think of a couple others. Tom, Thomas Williams, actually an athlete from South Carolina came up in camp and he killed it. Uh, I believe we ran a four, four. I think he's a, I think he's a running back at the next level. I need to get a better feel for what Penn state's thinking there, uh, but he's, he's going to make the trip up from South Carolina. So there will be a lot of others. I mentioned Lamont Payne already. I, when it's all said and done, just looking at history, I, I would think that Penn state, Maybe full scholarship 2023 guy to come up this weekend. Uh, that that's just gonna look back on previous years. It may be it may be even more just because of how far they are along in 2022. But I mean, I would expect at least probably two to three dozen top 2023 prospects. Then you'll have another handful, maybe five to ten, who don't have a scholarship offer yet, but the staff's really watching hard, kind of like a Joey Schlafler. Um, who, who will come up and then probably get an offer later in the year. Um, you know, whether they're from, like we were talking about Pennsylvania earlier and, and, and guys to mosh. Um, there, there'll be a couple of those guys, guys from Virginia and New Jersey. Um, there's, there's, like I said, they've handed out the majority of their offers uh, for, for, for the region so far, but there's always a handful of guys they're watching. And there's always, uh, after the whiteout game, it, it always feels like there's a surprise commitment as well. Somebody who gets so excited by the crowd that they end <laughs> up committing, whether it's Guy. I, I, uh, Mega Barnwell committed after the whiteout a couple years, right? Like when he was in ninth grade. I think that's that, mm-hmm. that track. I, yeah. I, I'm not sure if it was after the whiteout, uh, but he was up for the whiteout. I do know that. And actually, Mega's, Mega's a name I, I forgot to mention. He, he will be up as well. Man, he's pushing what is it 260 270 now i feel like he's going to be an offensive offensive tackle I, meg if you're watching this i know you do i don't want to hear that i know you want to be a tight end uh but man he's getting big so i'm and he's, and six, he's seven really now. athletic though he's, he's big yes yeah yeah he's yeah. he's a he's a really big kid so we'll see i mean if he if he commits to, to being an offensive lineman uh with his he's athleticism I, yeah yeah so yeah. he wants to be That's a tight a, end i get it uh that was the first thing right. I when when I saw his film originally. That was the first thing I thought is this kid could be a franchise left tackle. And yeah. I mean, it's not like left tackles aren't really valuable in football. So and I understand. I always wanted to be a receiver growing up, but I'm tiny, so it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's a great kid though too. So, so we'll see how he develops. Yeah, well, that that's he's a fun one to watch. I always like watching uh, that sort of progression over time. Uh, something that's really fun, something that's really exciting, something that I want to get to right now. 
Mr. Ryan Snyder's best bets for the week. We're going to start talking about what's coming up in college football this weekend and what uh, you're looking at. You have a Mac-heavy lineup here. Tell us, just give us the broad overview of the games we're looking at this week. <laughs> yeah, so you have, um, you're missing one there. Cal TCU's also in the mix. Oh, but, yeah, um, yeah. It's a, it, you're, you, I love the graphic, by the way. You're, you're, you're killing it with that. So, yeah, there's, there's two MAC teams I like there, of course, uh, Buffalo and Toledo. We'll, we'll get into each of these games. Uh, wh- which one you want to start with, T. Frank? You want to start with, uh, let's see, Iowa State's probably the big game this week. We'll save Penn State for the end. You want to start with Toledo against Notre Dame? Yeah, let's start there. Let's start Toledo Notre Dame. That you're, you're, you're taking the points here with Toledo, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, look, I, I think I think Toledo's the favorite in the MAC this year. They're they're a pretty talented squad. Bring back a a good bit of. I think they have two or three guys who could play in the league uh, or at least get drafted next year. You know, wide receiver uh, Isaiah Winstead's a pretty pretty solid player. I think could uh, Notre Dame secondary is great. We all saw what Hamilton did last week, but. Uh, I think he could have some success against them. Uh, their offensive line, man, they bring just about everybody back. And, of course, a lot of Mac school offensive lines are a little smaller. Uh, Notre Dame's – I expect Notre Dame to obviously still have some success penetrating that O-line. But uh, this is just a just a, a talented squad uh, f- for the Mac. I think Tyson Anderson's a, a really good secondary player. I believe, I believe he's a safety. He should be playing in the NFL. And uh, Deontay Johnson's a really good linebacker from, from Toledo that I like. So – uh, look, Notre Dame should win this game, but they're coming off a short week. I, I, like, I've I've been high on Toledo for a while now. We talked about in our last gambling podcast two or two ones ago, since you and I just did one. Uh, Toledo was actually one of the schools that I liked their season win total to to get to, to get to nine wins potentially. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the points here. You know, with, with Notre Dame having a short week, quick turnaround. Uh, you know, I just I. I I like the Rockets here. So we'll, we'll take 17. I could see this being a situation where Notre Dame gets up 20, 21, and, and maybe Toledo gets a backdoor cover. So I'll roll with the Rockets. Uh, quick quick note, we, you were 5-2 and two last week when it came to uh, our picks. Yeah. And one of them, I believe, was, was the Notre Dame-Florida State game because, I, I mean, like I, I said— lost I, that one. You, oh, that was one of the ones we <laughs> not to bring not to bring up the negative. We lost that one. <laughs> well, my point yeah. my point is that Notre Dame is volatile, and and mm-hmm. I don't trust them at any point. So, but I understand why we're going with Toledo here. I think that's that's a that's a good point. Let's head on to uh, Iowa State and that game. What what are you seeing here with Iowa State Iowa? Yeah, so I love Iowa. We we talked. I had Iowa last week over Indiana. Big Hawkeye. Uh, I don't want to say supporter, but I believe they're going to have a, a really good season. But I, I will take Iowa State here at home, given for – look, Brock Purdy, Brees Hall. The, first off, they're two of my favorite players in, in college football. I believe Iowa's won five straight against them. If the Cyclones can't get it done here, I just don't know when they're ever going to they're ever gonna beat uh, Iowa. So, you know, I, I'll just say this is kind of – just kind of going with with my heart here more than a bunch of background information because Iowa has had a lot of success over the Cyclones this year. But uh, you know, college game days going there, it should be a, should be a great atmosphere. Uh, and and I'll I just I'll take I think the quarterbacks the the better between the two. I, I, Brees Hall's an, an awesome running back, and and I'll ro- I'll roll with the Cyclones here. I think this is just the year that they they finally get over the hump and you know give them four. I, I think they can win this game by a touchdown. So. Uh, Iowa State minus four. That's my pick. This is this is one of those situations with Iowa State of they've proven that at a place it's not traditional to be consistently good. They've been consistently good, and it, you're right. Mm-hmm. It, this is one of those get over the hump games, and uh, <laughs> with with that roster and that staff, this is kind of that that last gasp to do it with this current group of players. One thing that I like here: the over under forty six. Iowa State's got a really good defense traditionally. Iowa's got a really good defense traditionally. I would think the under on this one because they're two defensive-minded teams with really good schemes. It's not just that they have talent. It's that I think that the uh, the Iowa State defense presents a lot of challenges. Now, that's typically towards more spread teams. So Iowa, with their big run approach front, 
might have a little more success. But still, that approach is not going to get you 60 points in a game. So I would go uh, yeah. with this one. I would go on the under for the point total. Let's move on to the one I forgot, Cal. Uh, and you're, again, riding high on the Chip Kelly Express. Tell me what you see in this game. <laughs> Justin Wilcox, shit, uh, Cal, UCLA is Chip Kelly. Come on, T. Frank. Step it up. Oh, my team. gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were talking I, Chip last week, man. East hey, Coast I biased. Had that one last East week. Coast biased. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't pay attention. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, buddy. So I'm rolling. Listen, I, I like Cal here plus 11 and a half. Uh, TCU romped the cane last week. The cane's one of the, the lower tier FCS schools. Uh, and Cal suffered a tough loss to Nevada. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I just uh, – listen, Justin Wilcox is awesome in these situations. As an underdog, 8-2 uh, and two against the spread since 2019. And six of those eight wins against the spread were outright victories. So he just – you know, they, since he's taken over the program, they've really kind of um, succeeded in, in this kind of a role. So th this actually, this point spread started around nine and a half and it's up to 11 and a half now. I just think it's going the wrong way. So uh, TCU, I'm not sold on yet. They've, they've been up and down in recent years. And um, as I mentioned, I, Cal just usually plays pretty well in these roles. I think Nevada too gave them a good, I mean, obviously Nevada beat them last week, uh, but just getting that experience to play a solid uh, FBS program over TCU playing Duquesne, who, um, you know, I, I, I love the Dukes. I have a friend or two who, who played out there back in the day, but you know, they're, they're not uh, James Madison or one of those uh, top end FCS programs. So I think just Cal, yeah, after last week being challenged, they'll, they'll make some mistakes. And uh, I, I like, I like the golden bears getting, getting 11 and a half here. I, I think, I don't know sure if they'll, they'll get the, uh, the outright upset, uh, but uh, if they if they lose by more than 10 here, I'd be surprised. I think this will come down to a pretty close game. TCU probably maybe will edge it out at home, but I'll take the uh, Golden Bears. Let's go back to the MAC and let's talk my uh, area of expertise. That would be Buffalo. Now, you've got Buffalo uh, plus 14 here. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing with Nebraska. Which I shouldn't I'm not probably. Seeing a lot that I like. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a pretty obvious <laughs> question. But in this particular in this particular situation, Buffalo lost a lot last year, and you're still riding high with Buffalo as compared to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, it, this is more so a bet against Nebraska than yeah. that I love uh, Buffalo right now. I mean, look, even last week, I just don't trust Nebraska to not make mistakes. They've done it for. Two years now where they constantly, you know, turnovers or whatnot, always keep the opponent in the game. And, I mean, even last week, they're playing Fordham. They turned it over twice, you know. I mean, obviously, they, yeah. they end up getting the win there, but um, they just – they constantly shoot themselves in the foot. They're on the hot seat. Tension or, uh, tensions have to be high out there. Um, I'll, I'll take the 14. I, and, look, um, you know, Buffalo did lose a lot, and, and they played Wagner last week, but uh, – it was the exact opposite compared to Nebraska, where uh, no turnovers. You know, they, they were supposed to romp Wagner. They did. You know, they I think they rushed for well over 300 plus yards. And uh, you know, Illinois had success rushing against Nebraska. I think they had a, about 170 yards rushing. So I don't know if Buffalo will be able to do that. But you know, getting getting 14, <clears throat> this this screams of a game that you know uh, maybe a seven point game, a 10 point game going into the fourth quarter. Uh, sure, Nebraska may even get up 14, 17 at some point, but this is another one that uh, you know I could see Buffalo, uh, you know, getting a late, getting a late touchdown, getting a backdoor cover. You know, there's there's part of me that also thinks that Buffalo can just flat out win this game, but yeah, uh, we have a lot, <clears throat> we have a lot to learn about them. <clears throat> of course, lose, excuse me, my throat's killing me. Uh, of course, lose. I mean, I love Lance uh, Leopold. Uh, obviously, I, he's got he's got a tough situation at Kansas now, but uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll take Buffalo here. I, I think they're they're you know, probably the third best team in the MAC, maybe the fourth best team in the MAC, and the MAC's actually kind of solid this year when you include Ball State, um, West or Central Michigan, Western Michigan. I believe they lost to Michigan last week, but I think they're a solid team too. So, give me give let, me the points and uh, go go MAC. Let, let me ask you this: What on Nebraska's offense threatens you? <clears throat> what what is there? That really is a problem because when, when, you know, watching them last year versus Penn State, watching them week one, did some film study on them. Yeah, there are some unique wrinkles in their running game, but that's it. 
Like that that's mm -hmm. and once you see them a couple of times, this is I think where Scott Frost has a problem is, you know, Adrian Martinez is is not a, a competent quarterback enough from the throwing aspect of playing that position that he can put stress on the defense that opens up that running game. So if you, if you have to, yeah. I've always said, if you're, if you're leaning on the quarterback running game, it's a crutch. Literally you're leaning on it because other things aren't working. And when they go to it as much as they do, that's why you mm -hmm. have the situation you do offensively. They don't have the threats on the outside and on, on the defensive side, I think they try to run a, a, a more NFL style scheme. And this is the same thing I see with Duke. You're putting your corners on an island, and your corners are stranded. They're the ones that are stuck on the island. Like, you're putting these players in positions they can't succeed. But you're doing it because you have a scheme. That's that's bad. To me, that's bad process. And I see that a lot with those players of, we're going to run a man scheme. We're going to be this or that. And if you don't have the athletes then you can't run a man covered scheme. You just can't. Mm -hmm. And if you're Nebraska and that's been where you've been lacking over the years, these are the these are the systematic problems that they keep facing because they're running these particular schemes and situations and they can't recruit to the level they need to make those things work. So yeah, I, I I'm kind of with you. Buffalo, you know, I know there's a lot of turnover there. But at least it was a stable program last year. It was a program that had an identity, and they know what they were doing, and they're recruiting to it. And those those players and that talent is still there. Like that bedrock mm -hmm. is still there. So you know, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Next one, we got Texas and Arkansas. Tell me about this game and why you <clears throat> are on the Razorbacks. Yeah, the Fighting Sam Pittmans, man. Look, they they played really well last year in a lot of games. They covered quite a few. Um, what is the number? I believe it's 10 and three in their last 13 games as an underdog. Here we are at home. Yes. Texas looked good last week and Louisiana is a solid squad. Um, yeah. but <clears throat> I think Hudson card, I think Hudson cards are going to be a quality quarterback, but this is going to be tough, man. This is an old time rivalry. Our Arkansas fans are going to go nuts for yeah. this game, man. This, this means so much to them. This is kind of like of their last chances, Pitt, right? Yeah. Well, this is kind of like Pitt Penn state. Uh, in some ways where, you know, it's a rivalry that went away for a long time and now it's kind of being renewed, you know, Arkansas is at home and, you know, they, they just play really well, um, you know, as an underdog and, and in these kind of a situations where they're not expected to win the game, but they keep it close throughout, um, you know, getting seven here at home. <clears throat> I, 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 I love Sam Pittman. I think he's going to be a, a great coach for them, whether he, uh, takes Arkansas to that next level in the, in the West, obviously is going to be very hard, especially I would assume the divisions will get, uh, you know, changed up in, in the yeah. SEC once Oklahoma and Texas get there. But, but I, I, I see a lot in him. I think he's a great motivator and we saw that in quite a few games last year. So I'd, you know, like I said, this is a this is a monster game for Arkansas fans. I'm sure they're already out there tailgating and getting pumped for tomorrow. And uh, Texas, you know, with the, with a just a second game under Sarkeesian, there's going to be some bumps in the road. First big big away game for them. Um, I'll, I'll take the points here with uh, with the Razorbacks. See, I'm going to go a different place, and and I'm looking over at this point total again of 57. <clears throat> Steve Sarkeesian is one of the best offensive minds in college football. And if you're telling me in this situation that this is, a, it's going to be a shootout. I, to me, that that's if Arkansas wants to be in this game, they're going to have to put up points because Texas is going to put the, the, the throttle to the floor. And I, I'm not super in love with the skill position players at Texas just yet. I think those will get better under Sarkeesian, but I do think that schematically he can do some things kind of like Mike Yersich to put you in a bind down the field and then you just need a quarterback that can deliver the football. I think you're going to see that and, and this is going to be a big uh, point scoring game. So I would, if I'm looking at this, I would take the over 57 points. Last one here, speaking of Mike Yersich, Penn State, tell me you've got, you've got a unique one on this one. Tell me, Penn State, Ball State, what are you looking at? Yeah, so <clears throat> this red's 22 and a half depending on where you look. Look, Penn State's defense played so many snaps last week. I'm sure you've been talking about it uh, throughout yep. the week. We've all been talking about it. I mean, whenever P.J. must have – what did P.J. play? 70 snaps last week, something like that? Yeah, it was, uh, 69, 70, it was somewhere a, in there. Yeah, it was, a, it was a big number. So here's what I see. Here's how I see this game playing out. Uh, I could see um, the first quarter being a bit uh, – Maybe I don't want to call it slow, but you know maybe Penn State only gets a touchdown or whatnot. But I expect Penn State's defense to look great again. They they will miss Ellis Brooks in that first half. 
I think against a lot of other teams, it would be an issue. I, I have faith that, you know, Lakata can hold down the, the middle there against Ball State for a good bit. I'm going to roll with Penn State minus 12 for the first half. Okay, and I, this is pretty simple. I, I think the second quarter, Penn State will, will put the uh, you know pedal to the metal there and, and, and put up some points. I could see it being something like 24-7 uh, at, at the end of the first half. And if they get the opportunity uh, to, to rest guys in the second second half, they absolutely will and should uh, with yeah. Auburn coming up. Auburn's, you know, they're, they're still a big SEC team that uh, will, will be physical next week. So th- to me, I, I just – if you're taking the 22 or you're, you know, you're laying 22, I think that kind of leaves you, you open for, for a backdoor cover. If, if ball state can, you know, maybe get 14 or so points in the second half, Penn state's offense will, will try and rotate players too. I, I can see the second half being a bit dull. Uh, so, so take, you know, give, give 12 in the first half. Penn state, if Penn state should absolutely be up two touchdowns here uh, going into halftime. So I, yeah. that that's what I'm going to roll with here. I think we'll see something, like I said, 24 to, to seven, something like that, uh, going into the half. I just, I just, I feel, I feel it's just a safer bet because, uh, you, you're, you're risking a lot of second. I think you're going to see a lot of second string guys, uh, trying to, trying to get some PT because look, this and Nova, and aside from that, where are you going to get these guys reps? So I, and yeah. when you look at just the snap counts last week, it makes complete sense, you know, to rotate out those linebackers, to rotate out that secondary, and, and of course the, the defensive line, and of course the offensive guys too. I mean, they they, they need to to build some some depth that uh, really every position, but running back on offense. So I'll lay twelve and a half for the first half here, and uh, I think the Nittly Lions, uh, like I said, twenty four seven something like that going into halftime. I, I'm of two minds here because I, I do think Mike New and and Ball State they're a good team. Um, and, and I think when you talk up a Mac team, people think that you're saying they're going to compete in this game like into the third quarter. And that's not really what I'm saying here. I'm saying that they could present some challenges for Penn State because if they try to come out and establish the run, that's not going to work. The strength of the Penn State defense is up the middle with P.J. Mustafer. And I understand Ellsbrook's not being there, but J.C. Lucada is a very good run-stuffing linebacker. And if he, mm-hmm. you know, if he's playing that position and you play into that strength, then you're, yeah, you are going to get snowballed early. But Drew Plitt's a good quarterback when it comes to being able to distribute the football. I think they have enough athletes on the perimeter that if they try to go attack the underneath zone of Penn State, they could get a couple first downs. They could hold on to the ball a little longer. And if you get a couple three and outs on the Penn State side, this could be a little closer than you'd expect. Until Penn Mm -hmm. State decides to play football, like, you know, until they make their adjustments, because we've seen time and time again that when Penn State makes their adjustments, especially with uh, offensive coordinators like Yersich or with Joe Moorhead, that they're able to then come back, counter what you're doing and, and put the ball game away. So if that's the game scenario, then then I think that you're you're absolutely right. But there could be a couple of times where maybe Ball State's able to keep it a little bit closer for maybe a quarter. But yeah, in the second quarter, if they're not making adjustments and and kind of running away with this one, I do think that's kind of an issue for Penn State. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. You've got uh, 14 points at half is what you're saying, basically. That well, this will be yeah, put well, away. Yeah, they're given given 12. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I just if Penn State's not leading this this game by by two scores at halftime, um, something I don't think something something's going wrong. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I do think that they they should spread Penn State out though. Uh, you know that, that that's gonna that would make the most sense to me. You know, spread out those linebackers, uh, dink and dunk as much as you can because they're not going to be able to run against this defense. So that'll do it today for uh, Snyder's best bets and for our Friday edition of the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host Thomas Frank Card. Don't forget coming up post game after Ball State, we're going 15 minutes after the final whistle. I'll be providing you BWI live, the post game show, giving you reaction analysis, stats, everything that happens. See if I'm right. See if what I just said comes uh, comes true, or if I'm completely full of it. We'll discuss. We'll discuss then. <laughs> Ryan, thanks for coming on the show today. Always, man. Let's uh, let's have another uh, winning week here um, for best bets. Like you said, five and two last week. I actually didn't include Penn State uh, in, in that last week. I kind of just, you know, jumped around there. And when I went back yeah. and watched it, I, I don't think I gave. I thought I, I did say that I thought the best value was plus one eighty on on Penn State money line, but 
I also just kind of gave uh, contradictory points in and out on that one. So I didn't include uh, Penn State in, in my total uh, wins there. But, uh, you know, I, I think this is a, a another week where we can we can have a winning record. So let's let's get it done. We'll check back again next Friday with Snyder's Best Bets here on the BWI Daily Edition. We'll talk to you on Monday.